This is Twit. So you finished your PhD, and was that when you were approached to work on Minority Report? Yeah, it was one of those um, one of those confluences that's just so ridiculous that it can only happen in the real world. Um, I, you know, I. I finished my dissertation some months before and was kind of tidying up and publishing and doing the things you do while you figure out the next step. And Minority Report at that point just got really and truly and finally and fully green lit. Um, it had tried to get off the ground once or twice previously, uh, once even with Spielberg, but this time it was going to happen for real. And one of the, th- one of the pre-production activities was that the film's production designer, an extraordinary designer, an extraordinary guy named Alex McDowell was flying around the country basically visiting as many industrial labs and universities as he could, looking for advanced technology, sort of tech just on the cusp that would be both recognizable today, sort of, and could clearly extrapolate into the future with which to populate this world. Because Spielberg's brief to him, probably terrifyingly, was, this has to be a completely real world. I don't want it to feel like sci-fi. I want it to feel like this is just what you get if you wait around 50 years and drive to Washington, D.C. It looks like this. So, um, wow, what a long uh, segue and (laughs) intro. So so there's Alex uh, and the prop master, Jerry Moss, uh, stopping by the Media Lab. And I just sort of got into this hours-long discussion with him. And he looked at the Luminous Room stuff. And at some point he said, yeah, I think think this kind, this set of ideas probably solves one of our hardest design problems on Minority Report, which is Stephen wants to know what computers are going to look like. How do we operate them in 50 years? So it was 2025, is that the year it takes place? 2054. 2050. As it hits the streets, but when we started, it was set in 2080, and there was a moment when Stephen said, it's just too far, we can't predict. And he's right, you know, we can barely predict two years ahead at, at this point. And so he felt like 80 years was too much, uh, we pulled it back to 2044, and then for some reason that I've never gotten a good answer to or never never been able to figure out, right at the last minute, we went up by 10 years to 2054. <laughs> okay. So if you look really carefully, you can see a little bit of ADR or looping, uh, putting uh, putting different dates into actors' mouths to, to make the calendar math work out. So, <laughs> so they, they came to you and they, uh, they they wanted to see what computers were looked like. So were yeah. you in charge of all of the technology, like the big advertising screens, and, and what about the cars and stuff? Yeah, ultimately it was my job to make sure that all of the technology that would appear in the film knitted together, that uh, that it seemed to be, in fact, from a single, you know, consistent, coherent future that you would get to by just waiting around for 50 years, as I said, uh, and instead of being patched together. So that, that was a pretty broad charter. That didn't mean that I had to design everything, and you know, a film is uh, is a village and takes a village, and you know, there's lots and lots of insanely talented people involved, including a bunch of outside uh, consultants on the film. But that that kind of knit it together job was was a big one. And often I was in the position of uh, explaining how something would work. So the cars were designed by Harold Belker, but how would a car both drive on a horizontal surface and then drive up the side of a wall? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, what you get to pretty quickly, and what I, you know, what I started unearthing and extrapolating is maglev, right? It's a, a propulsion mm-hmm. technology that's been in development in Japan and Germany and a few other places for, for quite a while now, a non-contact thing that would, would have exactly those properties. And what's so exciting and fun about working that way, like, let's not just imagine the surface, but let's explain the tech all the way down and let's intersect that tech explanation with political explanation and sociological and anthropological and political explanation and aesthetic explanation and advertising, which runs the whole Minority Report world. What you get are these tendrils that kind of interleave uh, and have a lot of really fun, unexpected consequences um, that feel like the real world. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's worth going that deep. So was there anything that you had got just from the Philip K. Dick story that wasn't from uh, the script that you were given? The, uh, uh, not very much. I mean, the, if, you, if you go back and read the short story, which I did if, just a few years ago, there's not much there. It's very, very bare bones. Uh, and a lot of the characters are changed. The script itself went through so many iterations. Uh, even the, even the, who ended up being the heavy uh, in the end, the revelation about who'd been, you know, who'd been mucking with the system uh, went through different different transformations along the way. So there's um, the the key piece from the script that remains is, of course, the idea of the three precogs, the 
the uh, psychic teenagers who, um, uh, woe be to them, uh, have to lie in a bath and dream of violent crime all day long. So that's basically it. The, there was a, a set of MacGuffins around punch cards, which were like the, the, the 1960s version of the hard copy slash data or evidence from the analysis of the, of the precogs uh, that kind of transformed into the wooden balls uh, in the film. But there wasn't a whole lot else other than names. <laughs> well, and it's funny because I just recently rewatched it. Like, I don't mm. know that I'd seen it since it came out, but I had totally forgotten the biology aspect of it, the precogs, yeah. that there's so much, you know, that there's, the, I think of it as a movie where like, oh yeah, so much of that has come true. When, right. But really it's, you know, what's come true is the um, the sort of pre-crime and like using algorithms yeah, to right, be able right. to predict who's gonna, you know, who you need to arrest, who you need to look after. And then just the fact, um, I mean, just the gesturing that we see mm -hmm. a lot of, um, mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, so it, what you've created really is what sticks with people. Just the, you, the screen that everyone remembers right. and moving things around. And we'll get to, uh, Oblong Industries, which is, uh, your, <laughs> your business, uh, and how that, uh, relates to that. But I, I, I you know, I've forgotten what my question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, and I wanted to ask about you uh, had created, like you created an entire sort of, you, it's not like you just created sets for this. This is an entire basically operating system and you created right. a manual for it as well? Yeah, I mean, I had to, had, had to create and publish a bunch of artifacts that would train the actors and not just the actors, but the, you know, give, give clues to the director and the, you know, the people who are building props and costumes and the rest of it, how this system would work. And it, it went further too. I mean, I'd, I'd never worked on a film before, so I was incredibly naive. I didn't know how anyone else would go about doing this. And so I did the only thing I knew how to do, which is to design the system somewhat painstakingly as if it would need to get built, right? As if, as if the next step was gonna be to actually implement this. Cause you know, we'd, we'd been building stuff like it at MIT. And there was a moment when I had to decide whether to actually try to build it so it could work on set on the day as the cameras rolled or let the visual effects people composite the stuff in later. And we, we went with choice B, which is a good idea, uh, it, given, the, given the film context. But except for the fact that it wasn't implemented as running code, it was a very, very real system. It was a complete kind of domain-specific uh, control language, gestural control language, assembled from bits and pieces of American Sign Language and, you know, SWAT team and police command stuff and ground air traffic control signals and a bunch of other stuff that is real and that humans use to communicate with each other. Uh, and then, you know, all that gets distilled down to um, kind of a, a dictionary or a thesaurus that's handed out to the, to the team and the actors. And I uh, ended up making a, a training video as well just to, so that people could watch and see what it would look like. Which means that that uh, on the day when you're shooting those scenes, there's real intentionality. There's there's mm -hmm. there's real causality there. The actors know what they're doing. They know why they're doing it. They know what they would be seeing on the screen, and they know what their characters will be looking at on the screen when the film comes out. Uh, and that that kind of uh, that that level of uh, that dedication to verisimilitude, I think, is what what finally kind of comes bursting through the other end. 